All right, Elizabeth, uh, welcome to I Never Knew TV. All right. Um, please let the viewers know about the work Urban Creators have been doing in Philadelphia. Sure. So Urban Creators has been around for over 10 plus years now. And we've been working in our community as an urban farm. And not only just a farm, but, but an event space for community gatherings. And we also have a community organizing team. So we understand that land and growing our own food is crucial in our development as a people, as melanated people coming together. We are an all black space with all black staff. And uh, we really try and promote the idea of land sovereignty and food sovereignty as a new way of being and understanding that there's power in that that can be reclaimed ancestrally by growing our own food, by organizing together, by having community healing events, and using our sacred space in Lenape Hoking, originally home to the Lene Lenape, as the source to generate this change. Um, how has the community responded to what you've been doing there? The community has responded really well. Um, I often reference that my role wouldn't be possible without our community. So we have a very interdependent relationship in community and with our community. Our purpose is to serve our community. So if we are not doing that, then we are purposeless. Um, so we are a community driven space and our community responds to that. From weekly workshops that we hold, educational workshops where our community members can come out and learn to monthly wellness festivals where we can gather in community break bread together and celebrate all that we are doing on the land in community together. I looked on the Urban Creators website, it states the Urban Creators have 10 years plus experience building sustainable and equitable communities. Uh, can you clarify what do you mean by a sustainable and equitable community? Sure. So when I think of sustainability um, and I think of building uh, equitable spaces in our community, I think that they are actually interwoven. So sustainability is going to deal with the idea that whatever we're doing, we want to make sure it's able to be maintained for times beyond us. And this is something in a way that our ancestors moved for years and years before our time. When we build something sustainably, it means that once we leave something we've created, it may continue on. And that also means it's a fair practice. And that's where the equitable component comes in. Our community that we serve has historically been left out of equitable conversations at tables we were not welcome at. So redefining that through building sustainable systems that can serve as equitable platforms in our community is how those two are interwoven in our space. What advice would you give the people wanting to build a collective urban farm? I would, the advice I would give is definitely to do it. Um, I think one of the greatest lessons I've learned in this journey is the power of the people. The power is in the people. The land is here for us to come together and steward as a collective. And when we come together, we're much stronger than the feet of just one person alone. And oftentimes I've seen historically uh, communities come together and they're not always able to maintain that true fact that we are stronger together. Um, once we're able to see the fruits of our labor come to fruition from hard work, we understand it's not an easy process to get there, but many things have to be put to the side, like egos, like personal um, self-worth in that, and understanding our self-worth is actually defined by the worth of the collective. And to be able to shed your ego in that process is one of the most challenging things for the human experience that I've recognized and realized in this process. And uh, I want to say I've seen a lot of uh, groups do urban farming throughout the years. I was impressed with the, the decade. Uh, you've been doing it for a decade. And I wanted to ask, how have you dealt with people who weren't genuine coming in and leaving? And also, how has the people who have been there for a duration of time managed to... Uh, modify their yeah. egos because I, I see petty things like maybe i wasn't interviewed that person was interviewed this person wasn't highlighted right. and all type of weird behavior and i'm pretty sure you experienced it Absolutely. so how have you managed to deal with all that to keep the ship going yeah so something that's beautiful that we practice in our space is a co-centric leadership dynamic 
So we've abolished the idea that there's an, a sole executive director. We do run on a nonprofit structure, as they would say, but we practice co-centric leadership, meaning we go circles from the inside out rather than from the top down. And that's really important to do because it means everyone has a say in all of the decisions we make. We practice something called DARCI. It's a decision-making chart that you can use and folks can look that up, D-A-R-C-I. And it's a way where you can acknowledge who's the decider on something, who's accountable for something, who's responsible for something, who needs to just be informed and who needs to be communicated to, and who, where do the responsibilities within that chart lie. Oftentimes when people come into our space, it is so out of the norm of how the patriarchy outside of our space has designed structures uh -huh. to function that there's an adjustment period and most folks welcome that adjustment because it is something that is less likely to be found in other spaces but it's vital for the work that we do and that means all of our decisions take longer to make because we vote on everything every single person who's a member of our urban creators collective has a say in everything that we do from the food that we're planting and our community included. Um, we survey our community and ask, what do you want to see grown here? And that's how we make our decisions. And once we realize that the purpose that we're serving is far greater than just the one, just the I, and that the one is actually all, that really helps breed change. And those who that doesn't align with fall out of that way pretty quickly. And it's almost like a, a natural process where the seeds that aren't meant to be sown in that land to work in the collective community with us just don't remain. What advice would you give to people wanting to build a personal farm in an urban environment? Yes, I would say 100% build your own mini hyper hyper local farm if you have the space available, whether it's a side lot, whether it's your front stoop where you have just a raised bed, but I highly encourage it. I highly encourage folks to find out who's growing around you. Ask questions, see if any of your neighbors are growing a micro version of a farm, you know, next to their house or in a space that's readily accessible to them. And I encourage this because there's a sense of ownership and power that comes when you grow your own food and that breeds a sense of resilience. So you can come to the farm and learn the tools that we are teaching and then you can take them home and you can apply them for yourself. If you need fresh herbs, fresh greens, these are all things that are very able to grow in varieties of climates. And it's just about learning, one, what do you want to grow? How do you grow that? And what are the tools that you need to actually implement that? And then nature will do the rest. Um, I think it's a lot less daunting than people may think. It's I consider it... Um, a beautiful thing to grow your own food and once you have the tools and the education that you need it's a trial and error process not everything may take the first time but try again and that's the beauty in the seasons many health food advocates advise people to visit their local farmers market as you know all vendors and farmers at these markets are not created equal uh, what questions should people ask vendors and farmers to protect themselves from purchasing gmo produce or produce covered in harmful pesticides Sure, so I think of three top questions I would definitely ask if you're trying to prevent um, buying food at a farmer's market that could be covered in harmful pesticides or be GMO. So number one is gonna be, are you using GMO seeds to grow your food? That's a really important question that folks may not think of immediately when you're in front of a farm stand at a farmer's market. Number two is going to be, what type of herbicides and pesticides are you using? Um, that's also really important because we know as farmers that there are certain herbicides or pesticides that can be used that would be considered organic and some that are going to be very harmful that will actually never be able to actually leave with whatever crop it is that you're growing. There'll be residual amounts of that for the lifetime of that crop, even through consumption. And I think the, the third question that I would ask is, um, where are you growing your food? the soil that you're growing it in, uh, locating the farm that is actually growing this food, and can I come visit your farm? I think that's a huge question that the consumer doesn't always ask the person that they're receiving the good from. Um, we tell folks and encourage folks to come to the farm, come see the methods that we practice and that we preach, 
And that's a really important component because if this food is grown hyper locally, and locally can mean anywhere up to 100 and 150 mile radius away from where the farm, it, farmer is actually selling the produce. So asking that question and going out to see for yourself, I believe that can offer some of the best wisdom that a person who's buying these crops can seek by experiencing it themselves. What do you believe is the safest form of pest control when farming in an urban environment? All right, so I don't believe in the use of pesticides at all um, that are not organically derived. So there's two top favorites that I have, and that's going to be neem oil and diatomaceous earth. Neem oil is actually made from the neem seed, which is a tree. It comes from a tree. It's an evergreen tree. And we're able to um, extract the oil from those seeds and dilute it with water and spray different plants. There's some plants and some herbs that you're not going to want to spray with neem oil for certain reasons. But it does really good with things like mildew. Um, it's also a fungicide, so if you're dealing with fungus on the leaves of your plants. And it's also going to deter things like a tomato hornworm, uh, things like the white fly, um, aphids. Pests that are super common in household gardening and large-scale farming. Um, and it's an all-natural way that you can just spray the plants safely and then consume safely after they've been harvested and washed. Diatomaceous earth works a little differently. Um, it's actually made from these super fascinating organisms called diatoms. And diatoms are aquatic organisms. When they die, their exoskeleton is what's left behind. And it's what we know in the modern day, it's called silica. So we use this, it's a powder and it looks like clay. We mix that with water and we'll spray our plants with it. Um, certain plants do better with diatomaceous earth because it's gonna help deter pests that have a harder exoskeleton. So identifying what the pests you're managing are is really important before you choose your organic means of um, an herbicide. Uh, jumping back to the neem, what plants don't t do well with neem so viewers know? Sure, yeah. So some of like the softer leaf herbs like basil, oregano, I wouldn't use neem oil on. Um, sometimes it can be harsher on the actual plant skin as well, um, with the sun as well burning it. Um, I would steer away from using neem oil on those I use a technique, I don't know if it even works, but I, I usually look for produce that uh, has been eaten by some insect. Is that a good tactic to use it's in regards to uh, trying to figure out how much pesticide was put on it? Is it a good tactic or not? Hmm. In a farmer's market? Yeah. It could be a good tactic, but I do think that natural remedies can really deter pests. Yeah. Um, for example, I'm growing callaloo at the farm right now, and squash bugs decided to take over the callaloo. It almost looks like a little beetle with colorful dots on the back of it. And I use diatomaceous earth. The callaloo is thriving despite these little holes in some of the leaves from the, um, the squash bug. But the rest of it, after being sprayed with the diatomaceous earth, has deterred the squash bugs from being there. So it's not necessarily a good measure just knowing how much of a plant has been eaten or a crop that you're seeing and just observing, oh, this is pesticide free or this isn't. Yeah. It will tell you if you know anything has been used at all as a deterrent. Yeah. But um, I think asking the questions and then even seeing what type of destruction happened to the plant by certain pests that may be involved. Um, observing that and then paying close attention to the plant itself while it's still growing and seeing you know, what little organisms are on it is the best thing that's going to educate you on whether or not pesticides have been used. And um, what things grow well in your area that you use? Oh, a lot grows well. We have super sacred land um, in the heart of North Philadelphia. Um, some of our most popular things that we grow that thrive are collards. We grow a variety of collards. Um, this year we grew green glazed collards. Michael Twitty writes about green, green glazed collards in a book that he recently came out with um, as the preferred collard green if we're growing. It has a beautiful, uh, shiny finish on the leaves. It's actually more pest deterrent than the commercialized collard that we see that's more locally available um, in markets. We really like that it thrived this year. 
kale is thrives in our land. We do curly kale, red Russian kale, dino or lacinato kale, um, tomatoes, peppers, basil, oregano, uh, even corn. We grow a variety of corn. Right now we're growing some purple Peruvian corn specifically to harvest the antioxidant properties that are found in that purple expression through anthocyanins. So when the corn itself comes to fruition, we'll take the whole cob and dry it and grind that up into a powder, which you can then use in smoothies, etc. And it's using the corn in a versatile way. Some people might grow sweet corn as well, which is delicious for some folks. But what we're doing is intentionally growing to harvest the most nutrients possible in an earth-given crop, and that is purple Peruvian corn. And these are just some of the things that we see thrive. We grow through all the seasons at Life Do Grow Farm, and right now we're transitioning into our fall crops. Since fruits have pores, right, like the humans can absorb what's put on them, is it possible to rid fruits of harmful pesticides? Yeah, so the plain answer I can give is no. There is no way to 100% remove harmful pesticides from the fruits and vegetables that are being sprayed with them in commercial growing spaces. My best advice for folks is to buy food that has not been sprayed with pesticides that are harmful to us. There are methods you can use. I've seen a variety of methods online and I've used a variety of methods myself. You can take about two tablespoons of baking soda and mix that with water. Um, I'm not sure the exact ratio, but let's say two tablespoons to two cups and then you, know, you can increase that depending on how much fruit you have to wash. You can use things like apple cider vinegar. I've seen that as well for washing the fruit. But there's nothing that's going to take it out 100% from these fleshy fruits that we're seeing being sprayed with chemicals that are forever chemicals. Um, there is just no way. And for viewers, can you clearly explain what fleshy fruits are? Yes, sure. So things like a strawberry, things even like a tomato, these things have the ability to absorb um, anything that's sprayed on them. They're very interactive with the outer world around them. Um, but Fruits are more sensitive. Um, so when we think of things like berries, they have a very thin skin compared to something um, with a shell, like a nut or something like that. All of these things grow, but the way they're protected from their outer environment is different. And things like fruits, the bugs and the pests they love the most, they're the most easily accessible for them as well. So these harmful pesticides are trying to deter the bugs from even biting through that flesh. Um, and if we think about it on a nature scale, why would we want to consume something that these uh, insects or pests don't want to consume? Um, these are on micro levels. These chemicals that are being sprayed onto these fruits and vegetables are deterring things. When we, by nature, if we were to go up to this fruit or this vegetable, we would not want to eat it after it had just been sprayed with pesticides. Just because it's been X amount of time since it was originally sprayed doesn't change the fact that the fruit was actually able to absorb some of that. And then we, our bodies, absorb it too. Uh, so what would you recommend, or where would you recommend people purchase their fruits? Because some argue that you should only get organic fruits. Yes. But I know a dude that just purchases it. He just got his organic license, and I don't really think he's giving out. So, like, what is the route to go to kind of protect yourself from getting fruits that are highly saturated in pesticides? Growing your own, and that can be difficult depending on what region you're in. So, we're in the 7B region. That's a growing region that has been signified as where we grow in Philadelphia. Right now, we have two different types of raspberries. We have blackberries. We have a peach tree. Um, we have an elderberry tree, we have a pear tree, we have an apple tree. These are all things that we're able to grow hyper-locally. It's going to take a little more time because fruits sometimes will take longer than other crops to actually come to fruition and give you the fruits of the plant's labor. Um, one tree that I feel like doesn't get enough recognition, it's a fruit tree in North America, is the pawpaw tree. So we have about three or four pawpaw trees at the farm and pawpaws were a fruit that at some time in history didn't make the cut compared to fruits like apples. Um, they don't ship as well 
Um, they get bruised pretty easily and they're less aesthetically pleasing to consumers after they've been traveling for some time. And I believe that's the reason why you know, they're not seen as widely available. But the pawpaw tree thrives in North America. And when we think about what our ancestors were growing and eating in this land, the folks indigenous to this land we're on now in Lenape Hoking, the pawpaw tree was um, a pivotal fruit for them to honor and know as a sacred tree that would always prov provide fruit for them to then eat. Um, so also looking into what fruits are hyper-local to your environment naturally and choosing to eat them. Uh, what are your thoughts on about organic labeling in supermarkets? Uh, yeah, I think that organic labeling has become popularized. I think that there are many different things it can mean. We at the farm do not have an organic seal. Um, one thing that I try and educate folks on is to receive an organic seal. There has to be money involved. So that brings us back into this capitalist scheme of food systems that do not serve our people. So for us to be able to be recognized on a larger growing scale as an organic farm, we actually would have to pay money even to submit an application to become recognized as organic. So for myself, I recognize that there's barriers in place that prevent marginalized communities from even acquiring such a seal. And for me personally, if I know that I've grown it and it's organic or a local farm has, that's enough for me. Please explain what food and land sovereignty is and why you believe it will lead to real liberation. Sure. So food and land sovereignty are two terms. I appreciate you asking this question too because I think it's not something that's um, common rhetoric amongst our people and, and it should be. When we think of land sovereignty, I believe that land is a birthright. This is something that we come into this world and inherently should be ours to steward if we so choose. Unfortunately, systems have been designed and capitalism prevents us from acquiring land as freely as we should be able to. This means with no outer interference from the government, from corporations, from folks that are driven by capitalism and greed, allowing folks to remain on the land, steward the land, and allow them to just be. Where we are at the farm, we are entirely off-grid, so we rely on the city for nothing. We have solar panels that power all of the electricity on our farm. We harvest all of our rainwater. We've designed every structure to have a slanted roof where the gutters catch the water and it's stored in IBC tanks and we're able to water all of our crops and use that for washing our produce too. We installed um, a water filtration system, a very basic system. It's a three-tier filtration system. So we can use that same rainwater purified enough to be able to wash our produce and drink it if we wanted to. Um, these are activations of land sovereignty. When you allow the people to just be, what can come of that? And we've been able to cultivate this oasis of a space that does not rely on the city for anything. So we are actively practicing sovereignty in the way that we exist. Food sovereignty, um, that also pairs with land sovereignty, specifically in urban farming. So food sovereignty is the idea that we should be growing foods that are culturally relevant and appropriate to the communities that we are serving. When you go to certain supermarkets, you know, they're called a supermarket because they have an array of all of these things available for you. But when we look at the fresh foods, are they culturally relevant to the communities that they're serving? Are they part of a larger food system that has been designed historically not to serve all people? Before you continue, can you clarify what you mean by culturally relevant foods for the viewers? Yes, absolutely. So these are foods that are indigenous to your own cultural, cultural norms historically. Um, so a lot of the foods that we're growing at the farm are foods that are culturally relevant to the community that we serve. And we see the top one uh, being greens. This is a food that is highly nutritious and highly loved by our community historically. And there's reasons for that. Um, there's more foods that we can be growing that are even more culturally relevant to the African diaspora. And we practice things like seed saving and seed exchanging to continue that cultural relevance across farms. 
Um, there's one organization, the Black Urban Growers Network. They have an annual conference. And I went last year and we practiced seed saving and seed exchanging. The seeds that we brought were the blue shakamoxin bean seeds. And they're these beautiful, shiny seeds that have been in rotation um, since the Lene Lenape were stewarding our land in Philadelphia. That bean is a culturally relevant bean to the people of the land who had once been stewarding it before my time and our time there. All right. Does that answer the question? Is uh. But you need to, I need you to finish out. About? I, I, I know I deterred you. But you answered my question. <laughs> okay. I finish out with the land stewardship. Okay. Um, or food sovereignty. Land, food sovereignty. Okay. Food food sovereignty. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, so I think one really important thing to highlight when we talk about food sovereignty is the ways that our people have been kept out of conversations historically around food access and what it means to have the culturally relevant food that I speak on. There is more access to what I call um, dead food, so food that's been highly processed and highly removed from its natural state of being. When we practice food sovereignty, we understand that that is no way to live and no way to sustain a life, and it actually causes much more harm than good to our vessels, our beings, on every plane, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Um, food sovereignty allows us to reclaim our power through growing our own food and being a part of that process from start to finish. It means we are tilling our own land, taking care of our own land, stewarding our own land that we're growing our food on. And this is why I find land and food sovereignty very much intertwined. Allow us to have our land, let us be in peace, and allow us to grow the foods that we need to elevate us culturally and in community as one. What is the process of acquiring empty space in the city to use for urban farming? Okay. Yeah, so this question could have multiple answers, but I will say... It's not an easy process by design. It has a lot of complexities and a lot of uh, things that have to be understood before the land is actually acquired, especially for urban farming. Um, currently, well, but the number one question that you want to ask and find out is who owns the land? So if you come up upon a lot that you think would be suitable for you to grow on, the first thing you want to know is who owns that land. And it could be a variety of different avenues. It could be either the city owns this land, a corporation owns this land, um, developers who also could be a corporation own that land, or the land has just been left vacant. Uh, in a, between 2011 and 2012, the city of Philadelphia adopted um, an arm of their city, uh, of the city's, um, hmm, I'm not sure the right word for this, but their, their structure uh, called the Land Bank, the Philadelphia Land Bank. And the Land Bank was designed to acquire all vacant parcels of land. So the city was seeing hundreds of parcels of vacant land and they said well, well we'll design the land bank to acquire these parcels and then folks can come who may want to practice urban gardening farming and they can acquire the land through the land bank the problem with this is developers also have access to this land bank so a developer can go in and see a parcel of land that they may want to acquire and the city has appraised all of these lots at a certain amount a developer can pay cash and then seek ownership of that land and the land bank will let it go. For organizations such as Urban Creators and many other small farms and gardens throughout all of Philadelphia, we're currently in a land fight with the city. The land bank has not served its purpose of actually making these parcels of land more accessible to us. They have designed what they're calling a 30-year self-amortizing mortgage, which means, and Urban Creators is uh, an organization that has been offered this mortgage. What this means is the city came out and they appraised our land 
uh, Urban Creators Farm is now worth just over $1 million, according to the city of Philadelphia. Just for the land. Just for the land. And we know that price tag is so they can develop on it. Yeah. If they build housing, it's worth just over a million dollars. What we're doing right now with the land is everything in our power to prevent that. Um, we are a space that feeds our community and it must and will remain that way. This 30 year self amortizing mortgage comes with stipulations attached to the mortgage, such as the area must remain free and clear of debris. Um, put this into perspective of how unrealistic that is we have a six-tier compost system as just one example. Someone could come out from the city and see that, who's not a gardener, not a farmer, and they could say that's debris, that's trash. And suddenly, if we signed an agreement to this mortgage, it's taken away from us, and the city can then take the land back from us. The other problem this does for small organizations is it puts on our books a $1 million plus 30 year mortgage. Even though we don't have to pay in money uh, each year that goes by, should we violate some of the terms of this 30 year self amortizing mortgage, then we would be liable to owe the city. Um, so these are things that just aren't feasible for groups that are just trying to be with the land and grow the food. We are one of many groups that have come together in this land fight with the city because it shouldn't be so difficult to be able to acquire land to grow your own food. And it's a disservice to our community members. And it's truly uh, shameful to the city to think that prioritizing protecting these spaces is not what's at the forefront of conversations right now. Please explain the economics and politics behind food deserts. Sure. So I actually uh, don't use the term food desert. I use the food, the term food apartheid. Um, a food desert implies that this is a naturally occurring landscape. Communities that have been left out of access to fresh food. When in fact it's not a naturally occurring landscape, it is very much by design. Um, we can go as far back as to the times of redlining. Uh, when our communities were being formed strategically in ways that placed us in what we now are recognized as marginalized communities. Communities that have less access compared to other communities to simple things such as fresh locally grown food or even the supermarkets. There's more access to corner stores or what we call in Philly a poppy store than there are actual supermarkets. And something I touched on earlier, this idea of dead food, that's what's filling those stores, these highly, highly processed foods that really just mess with our ability to um, remain as well as we can as a multi-level human being, mentally, physically, spiritually. We know that the foods that we eat and that we consume directly play into that experience that we have on a daily basis. So through history, this was done intentionally. We were left out of the conversations around building more access to fresh locally grown food. And even that is a stretch just to get to a supermarket which may not have fresh locally grown food. Rough in many places. Yes, yes, it's very hard, but you have easy access to this corner store. These things were all strategically designed this way, the same way our communities were strategically designed to keep us together and out of access to these things. So when we think about, um, I think a term used was like a food oasis, I believe that there would have to be an entire systemic uh, reevaluation of how historically we have designed our communities to not have access to even getting fresh food from a supermarket. I believe that when we think of things like land sovereignty and food sovereignty, it plays directly into why we are in a food apartheid, specifically in the 19133 area code that we serve as urban creators in North Philly. I can name at least five different corner stores I can go to and walking distance, the grocery stores are too far. The farm is that link in between. 
And once we're able to educate folks, you can come in, you can learn, and you can also take some with you. And we're not going to charge you an arm and a leg for this produce like they might do at, say, a Whole Foods, which is totally inaccessible for our community, miles away. And it would require, you know, multiple steps of transportation if you didn't have a car. And it was designed specifically to be more accessible to white affluent neighborhoods. Um, the farm provides an alternative to that. The farm is an oasis in, the, in and of itself. If everyone had access to a side lot where they could grow their own food, and I'm saying like blocks and blocks of this, then maybe we could begin to touch on trying to heal what the system has designed to oppress us with the side that we exist in. But I do believe that it's near to impossible without recognizing historically how this has been created. And it was very much by design. The same way our food systems that don't serve us are part of that design. So our main clientele, our community, is elders and young folks. Those are two, yes, and you know, so there's an in-between there, which is a whole other topic of discussion as to it why. Makes sense, so it didn't. Yes, it does. It does make sense. Um, and I can share a brief story about um, our elders who live just down the block on Dakota Street, right across from the farm where we've cultivated a garden on that street. It's a, an extension of us where we're growing and we have community beds for folks to tend to them. There's five generations of a family that lives on Dakota Street, three of which are homeowners on that street. Their family came up uh, through the Great Migration, so we're going back in time now, and Miss Pat, who is the matriarch of their family, she has my number. She'll personally call me to see what we have growing. She's not always as able to actually physically make it to the farm, but she represents five generations of folks that are living on her block, and the number one thing that she would always ask about was greens. Yeah. So this is something that historically we've been consuming because there was a point in history where that's all that we had access to when we were taken here. And if we go back even further than that and we look at what our ancestors were eating on the continent, what our people are eating today on the continent, the motherland, uh, we see green leafy vegetables is a number one that people are consuming, whether it's from the Amaranth family like Kalaloo from the greens like collard greens, different varietals of kale, spinach. These are all things that we've been eating historically and our people still do eat today. And I think even Miss Pat and that story I tell about five generations who came up through the Great Migration and now have settled on the block across from the farm, they can access our food because it's hyper-local to them. And nine times out of 10, it's given freely. It's pay what you can. So we're trying to instill the idea of economic sovereignty as well. But that means meeting folks where they are. If you have $5 in your pocket, and that $5 at a Whole Foods can either get you a bunch of what I call the dead food, highly processed food, or can get you some produce. Which one are you going to spend money on? The one that's able to fill your shelves more and in your mind, which has also been programmed in the society we live that uh, really pushes capitalism and greed, we're going to think that the more that we acquire is better, right? So the more that you can get with that $5. Um, and you'd get even more if you take that $5 to a corner store for the dead food that we speak on. But if you take that $5 and you go to buy some organic, fresh, locally grown produce at one of the supermarkets and it's advertising it that way, you're going to notice the, the ticket, the price on that is a lot higher than the produce that may not be marked as organic or local. It's probably going to be GMO uh, nine times out of ten if it's not marked as non-GMO. Where would you put that five dollars? And when we ask ourselves these questions, you know, it really comes back to self and understanding that we are all interconnected. So I would put the five dollars towards what's going to get me, you know, the most bang for my buck, the most money uh, can buy is what I would like. When you come to the farm, you can get a whole uh, a whole bag of okra for one dollar. 
you can get three bunches of greens for one dollar. You're gonna make that five dollars stretch to have enough food that you'd hope it doesn't spoil in your fridge, you have so much of it. But we have to meet people where they are. So businesses that say they go into these communities trying to provide alternate means for fresh food have to understand the communities that they are entering before they just decide to give up hope and leave. We must meet people where they are and there's deep, deep education that has to happen before change can actually come. And that starts with us. That starts with us educating our own people, not receiving this education from the outside because oftentimes it's a lie and it's not meant to help us, it's meant to harm us. But if we can meet folks where they're at, like what we do at the farm, make it hyper available and teach the entire process from start to finish, someone will be more inclined to actually spend their money in that way. And then they can learn the tools of even how to cook something they cultivated or watch being cultivated very locally that they may not have known before. And I wanted to touch on um, the younger generation, right? Because yeah. I was pretty aware of that earlier. Why do you think this generation is so uh, interested in healthy eating? In I think this generation is interested in healthy eating and pursuing it because they've seen the side effects of the generations before them that were um, unfortunately the ones who first experienced the hardships that came from systems designed that to serve us, systems designed to harm us, the creation of supermarkets, the creation of highly processed foods, foods loaded with dyes and coloring to take something like a Cheeto, for example, made from corn. Um, that, that Cheeto puff doesn't resemble an ear of corn that you would see at the farm. It definitely doesn't. And even the color, you know, it's it's been manipulated and the process of fooling the mind into thinking that this is food, this is something I can consume that will give me life and sustain me. When in actuality, we've seen through time, it's adding to our own demise as a people. It's killing us from the inside out. And I think the younger generation is awakening into that and understanding it starts with self to make that choice. When I choose to eat better, my body feels differently. Why is that? Once you begin to question, when we feel something, we have a personal connection to it and that can spread that thought, the ideology of maybe this food actually isn't great for me and there's alternative means to help my body, my mind and my soul feel fueled entirely and even furthermore, have the energy I need to continue fighting these oppressive powers that be starts with me. And I believe this generation has woken up to that and is awakening um, daily to that. And I see that even at the farm, the amount of young people that come just seeking education, curiosity, wanting to see what's growing. How does that process happen? I've watched young ones go from age three now to age eight starting off looking at the soil and calling it dirt and that it's gross. And now they can name herbs, they can name plants, they can forage. That means, you know, identifying things that are just growing wild, like plantain or plantago major, uh, lamb's quarter. These are things all around Philly, mullen. And they're able to identify, this plant can help heal this in me. This plant can do this if I eat it. And knowledge is power. So there's something empowering when we're able to teach our young people this. And, and next step even from that is the economic freedom that that can gain them. Um, I have a lot of young folks I've come across making herbal products now, <laughs> using herbs as medicine, yes. And I, even today, I used a hair oil that a sister made and brought to our Alignment Wellness Festival. And it's called Amore Your Scalp, you know, to love your scalp. And this sister understood that the chemicals in a lot of the hair products we were using were toxic. So she started making her own hair products with just things from the land. And that's just a tip of the iceberg of the many, many ways people are coming into this reclamation of power and of self through just returning to our roots, returning to that which is natural. Uh, how does it make you feel that you contributed to the awakening of a different perspective of food and health and a lot of people? Um, it's probably the most soul-fulfilling part of the work that I do. Um, I, I tell folks, I don't go to work, I go and I walk in my way. 
there is something special about being able to shine the light on what's possible, to reimagine a future that's better than the current status quo and better than what has come before us. I know that my purpose in this lifetime is as a light worker to shine that light for others to see and step into their own power. And it's a beautiful thing to experience firsthand, especially in young people, but even more so in the elders in our community. They pour life into me and allow me to see the benefit of the work that I do. I do this because I know inherently and intrinsically that this is the way and that this is a message I'll continue to spread day after day. And I pray that others are able to wake up into that. But actually feeling that, witnessing that, seeing folks come back week after week for one of our mind your body and soul workshops where they're taking these things and applying them to real life situations is all that i've ever wanted to do and it, it gives me purpose truly and how do you keep the fire going during times when you're discouraged my ancestors uh, my ancestors allow me to keep that fire going because they walk with me every day and that's part of when we return to the land and return to our roots. There's a spiritual component in all of this that I think isn't spoken on enough. And it's something that you can only feel and know through energy when you actually engage and interact with the land in a way that we are one. Gaia, Mother Nature, um, as the Lenape called our land, Turtle Island. It's all very real that when we give back to the land, she then gives back to us in ways that we may not recognize at first that go far beyond just the fruits of our labor, just a crop, you know, coming to fruition and harvesting it. But there's something fulfilling that it brings to your soul um, to be a part of that process from seed to fruit and seeing the ripple effect that that has in the community around you. A lot of people speak about the spiritual connection they experience when tilling the soil. Yes. I would like you to speak about that and also speak about the life lessons you have learned from farming. Okay. Does it matter which order? No, it's okay. good. Oh, I may, I've learned many life lessons from farming. Number one is patience. Patience, it has waves in every aspect of life for me, but farming has genuinely kept that in the forefront of my being, of understanding patience is part of this entire process. Knowing the work that I do today, that I did yesterday, that I do tomorrow, that's work that I'm doing for future generations. Yes, there's an immediate impact on the community that I'm serving, and the people around me. But this is intergenerational work that has come from work that was done before my time, that even gave me the ability to have the platform today to stand on, to teach others, to show others, to educate one another, to be in collective community safely in a sacred green space. And I say sacred because spirituality is very much a part of it. We give thanks to the land we honor those who stewarded the land we're on before us because there was a lot of harm, hurt generationally to our people, melanated people, and we know this historically on the land. We were taken from a land and brought to a land that wasn't of our choice at a time in history when people were already stewarding this same land that we were brought to. And the common thread amongst all of this is we are all melanated beings. Uh, we are people of the sun, which the sun loves, and our melanin reacts in such a way that is powerful. And this isn't something that I always preach at the farm, but it's an intrinsic way in the way that I move, in the way that I spiritually understand we are connected and we are one. Um, the spirituality component comes from the same way we may thank one another for doing a good deed or doing something that you know, brought happiness to someone else. The land does that for us and she asks nothing other than to be patient, to till in a gentle way that's in tandem with the natural rhythms of the earth, to listen, listen to what she's telling us as we are in this process because it's ever evolving and it's changing and the earth will speak to us in ways that aren't of 
the normal way we might think we can receive. It's not going to be a voice telling you, but there's going to be subtle ways the land shows you what she needs. And when we're able to tune into that, we release ourselves from this paradigm that we are just these structural beings and we understand our energy is actually part of everything around us, including the food we grow. And that's why it's ever more important to know who grows your food. How is it grown? Is it done with intentionality? And I believe that can be felt in the food that you receive. If it doesn't work, try it again. Um, that's definitely a life lesson I've learned. I have tried uh, different farming methods, intuitive farming as I like to call it, where I may want to trellis something a certain way or you know, change how I'm growing something. But if that's not meant to be grown in a certain way or the change wasn't meant to happen, the land will let you know. <laughs> And the beauty of it is you have another season that's going to come and go and you try it again. You don't get discouraged. And that's the beauty in farming. I've heard so many mixed reviews. Some people say it was hard. It was easy. It's right in between. It's trial and error. It's not being so hard on yourself and understanding the same way the land will let you know this is not the way to grow. The same way you'll reap the bounty uh, when you do actually get the fruits of whatever it is that you've sown, those seeds that you've sown. And just like our thoughts, when we have these seeds, we put them in that earth. They germinate, they sprout, they come up, and they offer us this beautiful blessing of a fruit or a vegetable. Our thoughts have that same power. That seed started as just a farmer's thought of, I wonder if this can grow. I believe this can grow. I'm going to plant this in the earth with the intention for it to grow, and it was going to offer me something magical. Uh, that's alchemy. We are all alchemists, and that's a fascinating understanding, and it's another reclamation of our power. So knowing that is uh, something I've carried with me this whole time and will for the rest of my life. I think another lesson I've learned is the power of human connection in community transcends all oppressive powers that be. So when we remain steadfast in doing what we believe, planting the seeds that must be sown for our own ability to grow and transcend things that generationally have kept us. We are the most powerful when we do that as a collective in community. And that means that we must shed anything that prevents us from acquiring that state of existing as one not as one singular person, but as all of us together. Um, when we look at the rows of crops that we're growing at Life Do Grow Farm, it's a small but mighty farm, and certain crops do better together. So we interplant things like marigolds. They naturally will help keep certain pests away, and this interplanting is a way that we're increasing biodiversity, but also allowing the plants to just naturally be and exist in community with other plants that may appear or smell a little different than them, but they are part of that collective. And together, they're actually much stronger. And I believe the same is for human beings. We must come together collectively. And that is where we'll actually change community.